Good morning and welcome to another Micrographics and Fusion 360 webinar. Uh, today's webinar topic covers the new mesh tools that were introduced into Fusion 360 a couple of weeks ago, if not about a month or so ago. And uh, my name is Carl Van Rooyen. I'll be your presenter for today. I'm an application engineer with Micrographics at our Port Elizabeth branch. My email address up there on the screen, call at mgfx.co.za. And uh, today's topic, as mentioned, is covering the sort of new mesh tools within Fusion 360, a summary of what has been added and how does that change your workflow within Fusion when dealing with meshes. And uh, so we'll move on to the agenda here. Let's have a look at what we're going to cover. So we'll start off with a intro into the uh, intro into the presentation, what we're going to cover um, and why we're going to cover that. Uh, we'll have a look at the new mesh workspace. Uh, how do you basically access it? How would you bring a mesh in? Uh, once we've got a mesh in that workspace, we will then look at the new tools available. We'll do a demo on some of those new tools. Uh, we'll have a look at how does this impact workflow when dealing with uh, mesh geometry. And then we'll close off with a summary and a Q&A session. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to post them up in the TeamViewer chat. And this uh, session is being recorded and will be posted up onto our uh, YouTube channel, uh, Micrographics SA YouTube channel. So moving on to our intro. We will, uh, oh, as part of our intro, we're looking at, uh, you know, why work with mesh files. Uh, so, you know, why would you be needing to work with a mesh file? Uh, inside of Fusion. Uh, there's various different reasons. I think some of the most uh, common reasons nowadays would be to 3D print the file. Uh, that's actually our, our last point there in the list, but I'll start with that one. Uh, so 3D printing is becoming a big thing both uh, for the hobbyists as well as in industry. It's a nice quick way of rapid prototyping and uh, quite quickly, cheaply, and easily creating a, a, a model for maybe form, fit, and function studies. So with these uh, mesh tools, we can convert uh, solid geometry to mesh uh, to be able to create the 3D print. Um, or we may have downloaded a model uh, off of Thingiverse or we got a model from uh, scan data, our first point there. And we want to use that to then 3D print a object. Uh, so talking about scan data and looking at that uh, you know, scan data line item that I have there, um, I'll bring your attention to the image on the right hand side of this <clears throat> of the slide. Uh, this I got off of uh, Idea Beans page on Thingiverse. I'll credit I'll credit Idea Beans with the scan. Um, it's a scan of an old Xbox 360 controller. And uh, so we're able to take scan data from various uh, different platforms or scanners, get that data as a STL file, as a mesh file, and then import that into Fusion. And we can then design around that scanned data. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I embarked on a project to scan my swimming pool. Uh, I wanted to scan the surrounds of the swimming pool and design a deck to uh, build around the pool. And so using my phone and Autodesk Recap um, photo, I was able to take photos, get a scan of the backyard, bring that into software to then design the pool deck around the swimming pool. So just kind of one workflow from an engineering perspective, you may need to reverse engineer a 
a jig or a fixture to hold an object. Um, you may be reverse engineering that object to produce something similar, but with your own uh, engineering behind it. So we can bring in scanned data into uh, Fusion 360 as the mesh file and work around that as needed. So if we have a look, uh, that kind of brings us onto that reverse engineering, using that existing product to create um, your own. So let's, uh, as an example, on the, the scan of the Fusion 360, of uh, the Xbox 360 controller, uh, you may want to be, you may want to design silicone caps to fit onto the existing joysticks. And so the scan could be used to then modify and design your own uh, cap covers. So essentially we're reverse engineering the the existing geometry to create uh, a new product. Another example here would be to create a support that will hold two of the controllers. So here we are combining the existing mesh with, uh, with other solid geometry, designing that solid geometry around that existing scan to create our own um, product. So this can help with product development as well, you, being able to use existing meshes and uh, you know, develop new designs from those meshes or even edit those meshes and create your own designs from that existing mesh. So that is our, our basis for you know, why would we really want to work with meshes in, in Fusion. And uh, we'll see from the 3D printing front as well, you may have found a mesh file online that is ready to put into a slicer and print, but you want to make modifications to that. And so uh, we'll look at some of the new features that allow us to take an existing mesh, convert it back to a solid, and then make those modifications in a solid modeling environment which uh, you know some users may be more, or most users may be more familiar with. So, moving on to our first topic after the introduction, we're going to look at the new mesh uh, workspace. So, the new mesh workspace has been introduced to allow seamless interaction with uh, mesh files. Uh, so you're able to quite easily and seamlessly combine work with solid geometry, surface geometry, as well as mesh geometry. We can see in the image on the right-hand side that the mesh uh, sort of workspace, if I want to put it that way, is a tab next to your solid and surface tabs. So you can switch between the three different modeling techniques or three different ways of modeling quite easily now. They're not going into a specific mesh workspace just to work with mesh. You can chop and change quite easily between those solid surfaces and meshing. Uh, we've got a lot more control over uh, over the editing and uh, modifying of meshes. Uh, we have the ability to um, create a mesh from a solid or import an existing mesh. Uh, we have some improved tools within the mesh environment and we can also use historic or direct modeling options. So in Fusion, you know, typically when you import a neutral file like a step file or an IGES file, it would come in and you would be in your direct modeling environment where you can push and pull and you don't get that parametric history. Now with the mesh, uh, the mesh workspace, you are able to switch on your design history and parametrically edit your mesh. And this is quite a game changer because you can go back and easily change settings or change um, your edits. Uh, if you had made a mistake, maybe you scaled the part and the scale is wrong, you can quite easily go back and change the scale. Okay, so 
I'm going to jump into a demo here just to show an introduction into the Mesh workspace and kind of have a quick overview of what is available in that workspace. So I'm going to go ahead here and just open up a blank design. And we'll see that we are in the design workspace. And at the top, we have our solid tab to be able to do solid modeling, surface modeling, and as well as then the mesh uh, tab to be able to access all the mesh tools. Now on the left hand side here, we have our options for creating mesh, whether this is inserting an existing mesh file that you have, or if you want to tessellate and convert a solid into a mesh. And the last option we have here is the Create Mesh Section Sketch. So you can actually section a mesh and create a sketch from that section. We then have Prepare options where we can repair mesh, generate face groups, combine face groups, modification tools, and quite a array of modification tools here, anything from direct editing to remeshing, uh, reducing the mesh, and uh, a couple of other options we'll work through in a later demo. Uh, just as a start point for this demo within the mesh environment, we're going to use the insert mesh option to browse out and grab a mesh file to insert. So I'm going to go grab this desk organizer here. So I'm just going to grab the base file, STL file, hit open, and that brings that base file in. Now the advantage here with the using the insert method over opening going to file and open is that we can set the unit type. So we can see the centimeter, millimeter, and so on. So we have the option to select the correct unit type. We can also flip what is our up direction between the Z and the Y axis. So depending on which way we prefer to have the part. And the part can be centered on its, uh, essentially its center of gravity on the origin of the uh, design file, or we can move it up to the ground level. So the bottom of the part is going to be set on our, in this case, Z is up. So it will be on the X, Y axis of the part. So that would be a typical setup if you were going to print this. Once you have uh, brought this in, you can also adjust the position. So if you're not happy with the existing position, you can either use the uh, gizmo in the window to adjust the translation and rotation, or you can input set values in the numerical input section. Once you're happy with that, you'll hit OK, and that imports the mesh. Then from here, we would go through the usual steps of um, preparing and modifying, which we'll cover in a later demo. So I'll have a look at the, the new tools. Uh, this will be typically the first step after importing a mesh is to check to see if the mesh needs to be repaired. And the repair tool has four options on how you would um, repair the uh, the mesh and uh, these four options basically give you some simple uh, repairs from uh, just closing off holes to a complete uh, rebuild of the the mesh complete rebuilding and remeshing of the the actual mesh that you have so we've got the four different repair options. I'll show these off in the demo. Um, and you have more control where you can choose uh, the settings for the uh, for these repairs as well as running an analysis. You can analyze and visualize any defects within the model. Uh, so you'll see here on the right-hand side that image where we've got the option to analyze is to check. Uh, this mesh was good to go. We can see the mesh sanity check, the green check mark, and the defect types. We have no defects <coughs> under any of those defect types. Um, 
one of the next new tools here is your face group control. This allows you to create face groups using um, two different options, either a fast or an accurate option to create those face groups. And you have different settings for those. If we look on the right hand side, at the top we have the fast option and you can set a threshold if the face makes a turn greater than the threshold, you are then creating a new face um, group. Below that you have minimum face group size, that is essentially a percentage of the overall size. So you can adjust the uh, essentially the size of each face group that is created, whether you want to create a whole lot of small face groups or larger, uh, less and larger face groups. The preview option will give you a preview where it will colorize each face group. And uh, then at the bottom, the second option we have there for the type of face group creation is accurate. And uh, that will look at essentially scanning the part according to a boundary tolerance and training face groups according to that tolerance. Um, the one thing about the face groups, creating face groups, is that it does help in converting to solid. I have found that um, when using the convert to solid tool, it is uh, most of the time creating those face groups helps the algorithm identify the different, uh, you know, sort of flat areas, um, joints between the different face groups, and uh, it helps to convert that mesh to a solid a lot quicker and easier. Uh, some of the other options, or basically the next option that I was speaking about, that mesh to solid, allows you to take your existing mesh and convert it to a solid. Now in this case, the there are some sort of uh, guidelines to this. It works really well where the mesh that you are using was generated from CAD software. Uh, so somebody drew up a solid model or a surface model and they then generated a mesh from that. Uh, so it'll work really well with that. Uh, so typically if you've found something online, you've gone to GrabCAD, Thingiverse, uh, you know, sort of any of the big 3D printing sites, and you've downloaded a mesh from that site. A lot of the times that mesh was created from 3D CAD geometry. So the mesh to solid works really well with that type of geometry. Um, there is, or there are a couple of different options uh, where you can actually create a solid from scanned data from a mesh that was created in, let's say, something like Mesh Mixer and where you'd be able to convert that to a tessellated um, solid. Now what we're looking at on the right hand side here, the convert mesh options, we have two operations. The first is parametric and by selecting a, a parametric operation the mesh to solid conversion is stored in your timeline or your history as a parametric uh, feature. So this enables you to go back to that feature and modify it as needed. If you use the base feature option under the operation, what happens is a base solid is created. You can see there on the right hand side in the timeline, that base solid is the entry that you get into your timeline. So there is no longer a mesh to solid or convert mesh feature listed there. Uh, this basically means you can't go back and edit your settings in your convert mesh function. The method option will either convert your solid your mesh into a solid tessellated mesh. Uh, that is actually the first option that is not highlighted. Then the second option is the uh, parametric where it will basically uh, it'll basically convert a large flat surface into one single flat surface. Um, a cylinder will be converted into a proper cylindrical face. You won't have triangles that make up that face. Once again, we will view 
these options through the demo and having a look at some more of the tools here uh, I will have a look at these within the demo as well uh, we can scale our existing mesh or the mesh that we've pulled in we can take a mesh and create a shell from that mesh essentially offsetting that mesh either larger or smaller uh, to create a second layer of that mesh we can also combine two meshes together to create one mesh from those two meshes and then we also have the ability to section a mesh and create a sketch on that section just to name a few of these tools that are available okay let's jump into our demo just to show a couple of these these options and then i'll go into a component a single component to do or to basically recap a workflow uh, for converting meshes to a solid uh, so let's have a look at this mesh that was brought in uh, so i imported this mesh and if we have a look at the import we'll see the under the bodies we have the mesh body i have no warnings next to this mesh so there are probably no errors with the mesh but we'll go to the repair option anyway and select the mesh and we will see if we have any um, issues to cover uh, so i'm going to expand the analyze defects option out and enable the analyze option and what this will do is it will run an analysis of that mesh and highlight any issues related to that mesh our sanity check is on here so happy with that um, i spoke about the repair types we have the four different repair types close holes makes the least amount of changes to the mesh but basically it will uh, flip any triangles where the normal is reversed and it will close any existing holes in the model uh, we have the ability to stitch and remove which does everything closed holes does but it will also stitch triangles remove any double triangles and removes any degenerated faces um, and also if there are any tiny shells any small offsets between um, surface or between the mesh faces it will fix that uh, wrap basically does the same thing as the previous two so it does all of that plus extra um, it will wrap the surface of the mesh body essentially it will create a uh, mesh where all inner surfaces are destroyed so if you have any internal structure inside of this mesh all of that is removed and rebuild is basically rebuilding the entire mesh and remeshing the entire um, mesh itself so that is the slowest option it also does allow you to adjust the density if i enable the preview here on this component uh, we'll see it'll take a few seconds to adjust the preview here as it calculates the rebuilt mesh and with rebuild you also have the ability to set the rebuild type do you want to go fast do you want to preserve sharp edges do you want to rebuild this with accuracy where it rebuilds the mesh as accurately as possible or do you want to just do this uh, in a blocky style so that would be a pretty quick option there as well. I want to preserve sharp edges on this because this is a box, basically a lid. And we want to preserve sharp edges on that. We can actually see here that the chamfer is preserved on the sides of this box. May not always be the best option. We can see we are ending up with some lumpy sections here. So we may want to go with an accurate conversion and maybe increase the density to give more um, triangular faces. I'll change it over to accurate. We can see we're getting a much smoother edge. And we are still maintaining that chamfer. But we do have some issues. There. I may need to adjust the 
density. Uh, for the webinar, I'll keep the density as it is. I don't want this to take too long uh, to do the rebuild. I'm just going to hit OK here and let it rebuild that mesh. And that will run that rebuild. In the case of this mesh here that I had imported, uh, this would not have been necessary because the mesh was not or did not have any issues. Uh, if there were any problems with the mesh, <clears throat> doing this repair would definitely help with the upcoming processes on that existing mesh. I'm actually going to go over here to another file. Uh, this file in this case is actually being converted already, so we're jumping a few steps ahead here. So I'm going to pull that history back and we're going to have a look at the repair option on this mesh of this rabbit. This conversion of this mesh was using the tessellated option, so the solid will have tessellated faces on it, uh, so it won't be a smooth conversion. Um, if we have a look here, we're going a little bit backwards here on this one, but I'm going to edit the repair, and this is going to uh, look at the basically the parametric or uh, captured design history on these on the uh, mesh so I am able to go backwards and edit features as needed uh, this rabbit was a complete rebuild of an existing mesh body if I bring open or open up the analyze defects we will see that in this case we had a opening underneath uh, which has been closed by the rebuild preview. Uh, if I just take a preview off here, we can see that we now have an open boundary in the warning here and we can see that the boundary is highlighted in the model. So we see the perimeter of the boundary and we can choose now um, from the repair type what do we want to do? Uh, we could just do a close holes option and it would close up that hole. One issue with this is we don't have the ability to preserve the sharp edges on that. So I would like to preserve that sharp edge. So we would do a rebuild and preserve sharp edges to keep that sharp edge around the bottom of the habit. So we can see the mesh sanity check mesh is not closed. Mesh does not have positive volume. We've got those errors showing up. If you enable the preview, that will calculate the rebuild and show you the preview. And you will also then get an analysis of the model. So we can see running the preview, we no longer have open boundaries. The mesh is good. So we would hit OK. It would rebuild that mesh. And we would be back to this point here with a closed mesh. At this point here, we could continue on with any other modifications we need. In this case, the modification that was created here was to use that convert to mesh or convert mesh option. Now, I'm not going to run the, the full convert mesh option here. I will just step the timeline forward. But the idea here would be that you would select the body. You would choose if you want to have this captured as a parametric entry into your history or as a base feature and then you have two different methods your faceted where it creates those angular faces or prismatic where it will try convert flat faces into a prismatic flat body cylinders into cylinders and in this case the prismatic won't work so we we'll look at the faceted because we have such an organic shape you would hit okay and it would then convert that mesh into a solid. And there we have the end results of the mesh conversion. Now, my display settings here are set to visible edges. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to shaded. And we will see the result. And so we can see that faceted the reflections from the lighting on that faceted part. Now you can adjust this. You could remesh the 
uh, when you do the heel, you could remesh the model or even um, use the remeshing tools available to remesh that model to a finer mesh. Obviously, the finer the mesh, the more faces, the longer it will take to create the solid. So just bear that in mind. Okay. Just jumping back to another component here. I'm going to go ahead and delete the existing face groups. Uh, this mesh was inserted using the insert option. And for this example, what we want to look at is creating face groups to be able to convert this to the to a solid. Uh, so in this case here, yeah, it was a file, once again, downloaded off of, I think it was Thingiverse. And this file, I may want to make some changes, and personally, I'm more comfortable working with solids. So I may want to convert this back to a, a solid, and then use direct editing on the solid to make modifications to this. Now, if I go ahead and I switch the edges back on, we can see that this mesh is made up of large flat, or should I say, large triangles. And so we can see the triangle count in this mesh is as kind of low as possible for the geometry that we have. And this would be this would be indicative of a file that was converted from a solid to a mesh. And this would work really well to convert that mesh back to a solid. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I typically find that if you try to convert this mesh using the prismatic option, it may not always convert it to a solid. In this case here, yeah, I got an error, and the compute failed, operation failed, try just values, or cannot convert, uh, you generate face groups. So I'm going to go ahead here generate face groups, select the model and the face group type here, I'm going to go with fast and set a threshold angle. So the threshold angle here, this is quite a, you know, uh, quite a squared off component, so I should be able to go quite high on the threshold angle. Let's say going up to maybe 60 degrees. <clears throat> And I'll set the minimum face group size down as well to 10%. We'll enable the preview, and that will then show you the various face groups and the different sizes. Now, if I move the slider here for the minimum face group size to the right-hand side, back up to about uh, 0.2, we will see that the cutaway, the circular cutaway, and the face on the right-hand side are seen as a single face. Now, with this example, I have found that that causes problems with the convert to mesh option, so I would prefer to reduce the size here of the conversion so that we get a separate face across that corner. So we have face group count of 38. We'll hit OK. That will do a uh, create those face groups. There we have them created, and then once again, we can do the convert to mesh option uh, parametric with the prismatic option selected, and this one will be a lot quicker than the rabbit. As I'm talking, there it is done. We now have a solid that we can now work with. So I could go back to the solid environment, and grab something like the hole feature, pick a point and drill a hole through the solid Let's say through all, and now I've got that modified block. And quite easily back to the mesh environment, we can now do a tessellate, grab that solid, and then choose our refinement settings for tessellating this object. So as we change to the different options, high, medium, low, custom, that will adjust our settings below. So I'm going to go with a low option. Go to preview. 
and we can have a look at the preview. So we can see there the tessellation to convert this back to a solid. We have various options that we can uh, adjust within here to adjust the actual mesh that is created. So we've got uh, our surface and normal deviation maximum edge length that we are going to allow. So if we are not happy with the large triangular surfaces on the right, we can reduce that number, let's say, to 100. Okay, so there we see the update. So now the side of the part has more triangles to it. We can then hit OK, and that will convert that solid into a mesh and we are back to a mesh with those holes through the center. So quite easily jump back and forth between the two different modeling styles. Now from a modify aspect, I'm just gonna have a look at the reduce option. Now obviously I could have set up the tessellation options to reduce this mesh. However, we are able to use the reduce option to select a specific face and we can then reduce according to a specific uh, type. You know, we can set a tolerance, we can use it according to a proportion of the original mesh or a specific face count. So I'm going to go ahead here with a uniform face count and I want that face count to be let's say four faces. Enabling the preview will then show me those four faces. Let's see if I can get away with two. I'll hit OK. And that will then reduce that specified face. Uh, you can also do the body. So if we pick the entire body, I'm going to go ahead here and say that we want to reduce it by a proportion. And give that a preview and we will see that we get that reduction. Now here we need to be careful because we are losing geometry because we are reducing the mesh. So I'm going to cancel that one. We don't want to reduce the mesh on this, we want to keep our sharp edges. And uh, I think that will be enough for this example. Uh, so I want to move on to a, another example here where we look at a couple of, of other options. Uh, so I'm going to save a little bit of time here on this one. We've got the inserted geometry. So we've got this little adapter. I've created a work plane which are then used to split the solid or the mesh. So I'm just going to delete that last one. Uh, so we have a look here. We have a plane cut option uh, for your modifying the mesh. You're able to select the mesh that you want to cut as well as the cutting plane. And we'll flip this to keep the left-hand side. And my idea here is that I want to take this component, uh, remove the right-hand side of the component, so that portion of the component, and then essentially mirror that mesh over to the other side and combine it back together. So I'm going to trim this with no fill. Um, you have options to split to keep that side uh, where you split the body or you split the faces. In this case, I'm going to trim it off. I don't want that right-hand side and I'm not going to fill the mesh in. Uh, so we'll have an opening on the mesh on this side. We'll hit OK, that will trim the mesh, and we can see the open mesh. On the left-hand side, on the bodies folder, we'll see that there's now a warning, and it says the mesh is not closed, and the mesh does not have a positive volume. Now, unfortunately, we do not have any patterning commands in the mesh menu. And if we go to solids, and we try to mirror that mesh cannot select as an option to mirror. We can go bodies and try to select that body. It will not mirror that body. Even if we try to grab 
Uh, let's see. Let's have a look. Uh, we can grab that as a feature. Now we can. Let's see if we can pattern that feature. I'm going to mirror that around the center. I'll compute that as an adjust, and I've got a feeling that that's not going to work. So you'll find that your standard uh, kind of patterning tools might not work. However, you can move and copy. So I'm going to grab this body. So I'm going to grab that body and place the pivot point in the center. And I know that the distance that I want to pivot around from the center here is 7.6. Measured that earlier. Click down to set the pivot point. And what I'm going to do is rotate this with a copy. So I'll go ahead and rotate that round 180 degrees. It's OK to create a copy. And now I have those two mesh bodies, which I'm going to then use the combine command to select the target body, the tool body, and we're going to use the join operation. This is very similar to what you would have with um, combine for your solids. You've got the same options. Do we want to create a new component from this combine? Do we want to keep the tools? And do we want to have a preview? Uh, I'm just going to hit OK here. Have these two meshes combined. And let's have a look now if we do that again. Okay, there we go. So just uh, one thing that I missed there on this case. That opening on the mesh, it did not like having that opening to be able to connect the meshes end to end. Uh, so doing the combine option there, uh, sorry, doing the heel to close off those faces, <clears throat> that worked out pretty well to then be able to connect these two solids together. Okay, so I'm going to leave this at that. We're going to head back to the presentation and just want a quick recap on the workflow there if you are wanting to uh, take a solid or take a mesh and convert it back to a solid you would insert the mesh make sure that your scaling is correct run a repair to repair any issues with the mesh you can use the face groups option to create the various face groups to help identify the different faces edit the mesh as needed uh, so you can make any changes to the mesh itself and then you can convert mesh to solid to convert it back to a solid uh, and do any solid modeling from there so to summarize um, fusion 360 has introduced that new mesh tab with all of the meshing commands available on the mesh tab I by no means have covered everything in this presentation. Um, just covered a couple of the options just to kind of give you an idea of the workflow. Um, we do have more mesh features, uh, stronger mesh features available in Fusion 360 now. And uh, that's giving you more control over editing your meshes. Um, and we get that new mesh to solid functionality. And with the introduction of the mesh features, uh, all, all these new features, it's definitely going to make it a lot easier to work with mesh files um, within your assembly. So I mean, I've just looked at a mesh on its own, but you can incorporate that mesh into a component design, into an assembly, and something that has been available for a long time but could be used more often now with this is the ability to machine over, over meshes. So you can use a mesh as a surface geometry, as actual geometry, to create your tool parts on as well. So that is the, uh, the new mesh features, or at least some of the new mesh features in Fusion 360. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention. I'm going to open up for any questions and see if we have any questions that have come through.
Okay, we don't have any questions. So once again, I would like to thank you so much for your time and your attention. Um, this has been a micrographics webinar and uh, we have offices in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Durban, South Africa. And uh, if you have any questions, my email address is on the front slide. And we also have the email addresses here and contact numbers of our four, of our four offices. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.